Good morning and welcome to the Impact Stakeholder Committee's third and final meeting of 2023. As people are logging on, I'll go ahead and go over a few logistics for the meeting. Next slide, please. Um, we continue to meet in the virtual environment. American Sign Language is provided during this meeting and should be highlighted on your screen. Closed captioning is also available via Zoom, which you can select on the toolbar of your Zoom screen. And as always, we record this meeting. It is posted to YouTube as well as to California Health and Human Services Agency's Master Plan for Aging website, webpage, along with the transcript and the slides. Um, please, folks who are on the committee, please rename yourself in Zoom by right-clicking on your little video screen um, so we can see who is in attendance today. Next slide, please. We have reserved time on the agenda for public comment. So if you are a member of the public and would like to make a comment during that period, you can hit star nine if you're joining audio by phone, or you can hit click raise hand if you're joining by webinar. You can always send us comments and feedback at aging at, at gauge at aging.ca.gov. I'm gonna go ahead and hand this meeting over to California Department of Aging Director, Susan DeMorris. Thank you, Amanda, and welcome. Good morning to everyone who's with us. I understand others are still joining and may be late. Uh, just a, a very warm welcome. We have two of our new members with us that I can see on screen, Eric Dowdy and Linda Way. Welcome, Aaron, Eric and Linda. And we will be joined by Eric Harris and Kathleen Sullivan um, as well. So we're, we're so proud to welcome four new members to the Impact Committee today. Um, and I wanna welcome back our returning members. Uh, I just really wanna say when I interviewed um, each of you to assess your willingness to continue to serve, um, every one of you spoke so highly of the group and the process and especially Kevin's leadership. Um, and I was just really impressed um, that you've built a culture in this virtual environment as an, as an impact stakeholder group. Um, so thank you all for raising your hands and being willing to return. Um, today, I have just a few quick updates for you before I invite the governor's senior advisor, Kim McCoy Wade, to open our meeting. I wanted to report out uh, first on the two Little Hoover Commission hearings that focused on the MPA. Um, I wanted to update you on some housing developments, not physical de developments, but <laughs> developments in the housing space and share um, a budget success. Uh, so personally, I was impressed, very impressed by the Little Hoover Commission's thoughtfulness and, and their sincere interest in the MPA. Uh, as a group, they were very engaged in the content and throughout the, gosh, eight or 10 hours of the two hearings that they convened. And their report, the Little Hoover Commission's report should come out by the end of this year. So of course we look forward to any recommendations that they have um, and we'll share that with all of you. I also wanted to thank our MPA leaders who provided testimony at the two hearings, uh, starting first with Secretary Galley who, who joined the group for about an hour and took uh, a number of questions. And then Sarita and Fernando uh, represented the impact committee and stakeholders exceptionally well. We also heard from Carrie Graham, who you know helped um, develop the master plan for aging as a consultant to CDA and now leads the Center for Healthcare Strategies and is working with the 26 other states that are following California's uh, lead. Um, the second hearing focused um, really centered on housing and homelessness. And at that hearing, we benefited from Patty Prunhuber's testimony. We got to hear from Dr. Margot Cashel and um, Sasha Kurgan represented the Business Consumer Services and Housing Agency. So that was an all-star lineup and really, really substantive discussion. Um, a great outcome of the two uh, Little Hoover Commission hearings was the spreadsheet that we developed that quantifies the investments uh, to date through June 30th in the Master Plan for Aging. So these are targeted investments made by the governor and legislature that um, benefit older adults, people with disabilities, and family caregivers. 
and we'll share for you, we're sharing with you the, the total number was $9.4 billion. And that doesn't count uh, the July 1 budget that just passed. It's being updated already to reflect the new, the new numbers, but just a, a staggering dollar amount and our thanks to all of you for your advocacy that helped make that possible. Um, building off the hearing um, that focused on housing, uh, there are two, two updates I wanted to make. One is the Interagency Council on Homelessness met, uh, met just a couple weeks ago. And you may know that's co-chaired by Secretary Galley and Secretary Castro Ramirez. And they highlighted the UCSF study on adults uh, Dr. Margot Cashel gave an excellent update and a um, lot of interest in older adults um, in that discussion. Um, on October 3rd, CDA is convening um, an invitational roundtable. The title is Preventing and Ending Older Adult Homelessness. We will be joined by about 50 subject matter experts and thought leaders, um, and we'll be the day will be let off by Secretary Galley in Los Angeles. Um, and we expect to have a report that will come out by the end of the year following this convening that will highlight um, the solutions and recommendations from the group. Uh, and then last, I wanted to just extend our thanks to the governor and the legislature for the unprecedented investment of $50 million in the July 1 budget for older adult behavioral health. This um, has been directed to CDA and it allows for three things to happen. Uh, one, the continuation of Friendship Line, and two, a targeted ethnic media campaign that's already underway. And then third, the biggest chunk of the funding will go um, to build local community capacity. About $30 million will be, will be made available after the first of the year for um, grants to local CBOs and agencies to build their um, behavioral health capacity for older adults. Um, we've also been um, thrilled that in the last uh, six months or so, we've had um, some really fruitful conversations with West Health and the SCAN Foundation um, about their commitment to older adult behavioral health. And, and we're really excited to hear later in the agenda from Stephanie Welch about how, how all of this fits together um, as a statewide priority. So those were my updates for this morning, and now it's uh, my absolute pleasure to turn the agenda over to Kim McCoy Wade. Kim, thanks for joining us today, making time and providing an update from the governor's office. Welcome. Good morning, and thank you so much. It's always wonderful to be back with you all, uh, even virtually. Um, yes, I am delighted to make a couple quick updates from the governor's office. Uh, as well as um, I do have a number of thank yous I want to uh, share this morning, and then, of course, a request as we move this work forward together. Um, so first of all, just a couple things. I hope everybody saw the governor uh, joining Hillary Clinton and uh, the Ford Foundation last week in New York for a panel on the care economy and all that California is doing to lead in the care economy, defined as uh, child care investments, home and community-based care for older and disabled people, paid family leave for family caregivers, and fourth, support for the care workforce across the lifespan. Uh, so if you haven't seen that, we'll send that around, but uh, part of uh, California is not just leadership in each of those pieces, but to also uh, bring it together into a true nation-leading care economy. Uh, second, I did wanna report that the cabinet work group leadership convening series continues by popular demand. Uh, we this year have decided to go deeper with our cabinet uh, leadership, but as you may remember, the first half of the year, we, convert, we convened our cabinet leaders on uh, equity, uh, with justice and aging presenting, on communications to and about older adults with Department of Aging presenting, and uh, data and aging with both the Department of Finance and the Department of Aging presenting. Uh, we've now had two more. Uh, convenings across agency leadership, one on philanthropy uh, and how every portfolio in philanthropy is an aging portfolio. Uh, and uh, we were joined by Janet Spears, not only in her meta hat and master plan hat, but also as the chair of the Northern California grant makers. And so we are looking at coming back to philanthropy California 
and doing an update on all the work to date and all the continuing work to do uh, in aging. So more to come there. And then we just in September had one on intergenerational volunteering. How as we bring people back to volunteering after the pandemic, we wanna focus as much on volunteering with as volunteering for. Uh, and that Eunice Lynn from Cogenerate joined us. Um, you may know her from um, previously Encore with Mark Friedman. She's the co-executive director and really challenged us and inspired us to think about how AmeriCorps, Experience Corps, Climate Corps, and of course our parks and arts volunteers can be places. Uh, well, and I'd be remiss if I didn't say the first partners charge to all of us to make sure community schools are truly intergenerational, all age community uh, for, for our students. So there's lots of follow-up work happening on those two fronts as well. Um, beyond that, I really just wanna appreciate so much of what Susan has touched on. To all of you for making Little Hoover such a positive spotlight within California. I know we all know sometimes we're so busy doing the work that um, we don't have time to tell about it, much less add it all up. And that 9.4 billion number is truly extraordinary. I think it's more than any of us realized. Uh, and I appreciate all the work that all of you did testifying, preparing that and getting the word out. And of course, more to come uh, with when the report's released. I also wanna lift up Commission on Aging, um, our partner here in the administration on uh, leading in a couple spaces. They have done tremendous work uh, on uh, something we all know and love is Bagley Keene, critical to public meetings, critical to public accountability, but also not always accessible to the full diversity of Californians, particularly older adults and people with disabilities, people with caregiving, people in the South. It's actually quite a lot of the state. Uh, and they really worked with the um, author and they really worked with the governor's office for the last nine months to come to something that the governor could sign, SB 544, that will continue, especially for advisory committees such as this, uh, to allow the maximum uh, participation that we could work out. Um, and so thank you to them for getting in early, staying in there, working through it, and really advocating for all commissions and advisory boards to be representative and inclusive and be the best of California. And I have to also give them some credit for all the work that, not just some, a lot of credit for really centering behavioral health for older adults. I think it was about a year ago, Susan, is that right? When the, when the uh, convening for all ages and all abilities was, and they really challenged uh, the secretary and the governor to do more for behavioral health. And here we are, not just with the behavioral health investment, but also they worked with us on the governor's mental health reform package that Stephanie will lead us through to make sure there's more representation for older adults and disabled adults and veterans uh, on these commissions at all levels and also to make sure mental health decisions are data-driven, including by age and the intersection with age and race, uh, age and gender. Um, and so things like the alarming rates of self-harm and suicide by older white men in particular will be part of what the system responds to as well as the many other gaps uh, by race, by young people, rural areas. Um, we have a lot of work to do in this state. So look forward to having Stephanie's, but just wanted to thank the Commission on Aging for getting in early and getting in often and staying, staying in there. Um, and then my last thank you, I cannot believe this is Amanda Lawrence's last meeting. So I just have to say what to publicly what I have said to her privately, which is there would not be a master plan for aging without Amanda Lawrence, uh, period, full stop. The content, the collaboration, the fact that it looks so good, you guys have seen my Excel charts. Uh, it really is Amanda's vision and partnership and patience that made it what it is. So we'll, we will be missing her, but uh, now there's a lot more of us and the two of us uh, sitting in a Starbucks trying to figure it out. So uh, thank you <laughs> to Amanda. And so last but not least, um, I'm just uh, sitting here um, last week in September, uh, rounding the corner on whether you, whether you are thinking it's the fall, whether you are thinking it's the fourth quarter, whether you're thinking it's the beginning of the federal fiscal year, what it is in our world is the chance to plan and strategize. If you are thinking about bills for next year, if you are thinking about a bill that's become two year and where to go with that next year, even if you're thinking about budget, although we are uh, holding on that while we wait the fiscal forecast, please uh, talk to the departments, talk to the agencies, talk to uh, the governor's office, talk to each other 
so that we have really thoughtful proposals and really strategic plans to move them forward uh, and that we just can work through it the whole way. Um, I got to give a shout out to a couple of you who've already reached out for those meetings. So thank you very much um, and look forward to hearing from all of you as your agendas uh, gel and we make next year another terrific year together. So with that, Susan, let me hand it back to you and the great agenda you've got lined up. Thanks so much. Thank you, Kim. Thanks for joining us and for the update. And we join, we echo your um, thoughts about Amanda. We've, um, Amanda, you're going to be, you're already missed as we start, uh, you know, as we stop giving you new assignments as you wind down this week. Um, we miss you already. And we're so glad you can be here today um, for your final impact committee meeting. Um, thanks, Kim, and feel free to stay on. And we understand you probably have many things to get to. Uh, we'll now turn our agenda over to Sarah Steenhausen, and Sarah has two updates for us, just two little things called a gap analysis and LTSS financing. Sarah, take it away. Great. Thank you, Susan. It's wonderful to be here, and um, welcome to all of our new uh, committee members on the Impact Committee. Really excited to work with you all in this important effort that we're undertaking. So uh, I'm going to provide an update on our home and community-based services gap analysis and roadmap and our long-term services and supports financing and affordability effort, both of which are key and essential elements of advancing the master plan for aging. Next slide, please. So I wanted to start with where these initiatives uh, really match up with the whole long-term services and support system change approach. And we're really bucketing it into four different buckets that um, were informed in great part by the work of the Long-Term Services and Support Subcommittee and the report that they uh, uh, developed for the consideration of the state when the state was developing the master plan for aging. So if you could, Rosie, uh, hit the first advanced slide. So the first component to long-term services and support system change is financing. I know this is no surprise to anyone, but we know that Californians cannot afford the cost of long-term services and supports. Many are unaware that Medicare does not pay for long-term care, and so they're left in situations where they are essentially getting impoverished to try and pay for their LTSS needs. In addition to that, it's also a tremendous cost uh, burden on the state that uh, where so many people end up needing to uh, you know, uh, have all of their LTSS needs financed by Medi-Cal. So we're trying to think of ways to uh, can take the burden off of consumers and what we might do as a state to develop more financing alternatives. Next, Rosie. The second is access. So even if we fix the financing of our system, uh, we still have an issue where not everyone can receive the services they need depending on where they live or where the providers are. So we know that it's really critical to understand where home and community-based services are in the states and where the gap in the system are. And this is really where the home and community-based services gap analysis and roadmap comes into play. So uh, I'll be talking to you more about that in the next slide as well. Next, Rosie, please. The third issue is navigation. So even if we fix the financing of the system and we build out our infrastructure of home and community-based services statewide, it is very complicated for people to know how to access these services in a streamlined way. They don't know where to go. They don't get information on where services are available and not everybody knows where to start and, and even what questions to ask. And so this is where our key initiatives related to developing a no wrong door system and expanding access to our uh, aging and disability resource connections come into play. And then finally, Rosie, next is workforce. So even if we fix the financing of the system, we've built out our infrastructure, we've made it much easier for people to access services, we need to ensure that we have the direct care workers and the workforce across the continuum of care to provide services in a culturally responsive way. This also includes uh, supporting our unpaid family caregivers in the critical work that they do um, as they serve older adults and people with disabilities in the home and the community. 
So this kind of gives you a little bit of an overview of our system change efforts related to long-term services and support system change. Today, I'm just gonna give you a little extra information on where we are with the financing uh, and affordability efforts, as well as our infrastructure and access efforts through the HCBS gap analysis. So for the HCBS Home and Community-Based Services gap analysis and roadmap, this is a key initiative of the Master Plan for Aging that CDA and Department of Healthcare Services are partnering on together. It's a two-part um, initiative where the Department of Healthcare Services is contracted with Mathematica Consultancy to do a deep dive analysis into Medi-Cal home and community-based services, understanding where the population needs are, where the programs and services are available and where the gaps are. And from there, building a roadmap to uh, achieve statewide delivery of services. The second component of the uh, home and community-based services gap analysis and roadmap is the non-Medi-Cal home and community-based services. So this really gets to the fact that whether or not you are Medi-Cal eligible, uh, many of the services in our home and community-based services system are not funded by Medi-Cal and many people who are not eligible for Medi-Cal rely on a range of programs, whether it be through the Department of Aging's Older Americans Act programs, such as nutrition support and other supportive services, or if it's services provided by the Department of Rehabilitation through their independent living centers, um, as well as services provided by the Department of Public Health, as well as Department of Social Services, et cetera. And so CDA is supplementing the work that Department of Healthcare Services is doing. And we have contracted with Mathematica Consultancy as well to advance the gap analysis and build out a roadmap for how we achieved statewide access to services by 2030 on the non-Medi-Cal services and supports. So we're really, really excited to be working with our state partners on this. It's a kind of all of uh, agency um, a, a kind of effort to develop this um, analysis and roadmap. And I think what I also want to note is that in our gap analysis, we're also recognizing the tr critical role that housing and transportation play. So even if we build out our home and community-based services system, if people don't have a place to live and they don't have a way to get there, then the services are not as meaningful. So we are also including in our non-Medi-Cal gap analysis, an analysis of um, access to affordable and accessible housing, as well as uh, transportation. So we're really excited to be kind of including that important, important lens. At a very high level, I would say that the work across this initiative falls into three buckets. The first, which is where we are right now, is gathering all the data and understanding where the gaps in the system are. And this includes working with our department, cross-department partners and stakeholders as well to get input on um, how to define and how to understand where the services are across the state. Uh, stakeholder engagement is really critical to all of this. So it's kind of a two-part stakeholder engagement. Um, we have been meeting with stakeholders, including the uh, Disability and Aging Community Living Advisory Committee, the Transportation Subcommittee of it, the Housing Subcommittee as well, and having stakeholder webinars to get feedback and input on this important work. But second, we recognize the important role of hearing from our communities directly. So Mathematica has subcontracted with the Center for Healthcare Strategies to do a series of consumer listening sessions in many languages across the state, really targeting and understanding the needs of all of our um, community partners so that we understand where the gaps and services are and can be informed in a culturally responsive way about how to build out the roadmap. And then after we produce the gap analysis and roadmap, we will begin the work of figuring out, um, sorry, after we produce the gap analysis, we will begin launch of the, the roadmap development. Um, so that will be kind of the second part of this process, which again, stakeholder engagement will be really critical to. And we will be sure to keep you all apprised in the months ahead as we build out this work. Next slide, please. Uh, I wanted to now touch on our work in the space of long-term services and supports, uh, financing and affordability. 
Um, the Department of Aging was really fortunate last year to be awarded $5 million um, in the state budget to uh, do policy and research on policy development and research on our long term services and supports financing system. So the project objectives just at a very high level are to obtain consumer and stakeholder input on the issue and on the potential pathways forward. And then to do a deep dive of data, like really looking at where the population's needs are and what is the targeted population that we are looking at um, in order to inform this work. And from those projections and analyses, then identifying what are some potential policy solutions and pathways forward. Because I think what's important to recognize is that uh, this committee has been really instrumental in lifting up this issue and recognizing the needs of the missing middle or the forgotten middle. But the forgotten middle is a pretty, uh, it's, there's a, a widespread in that, that population. So we really wanna dig in and understand the needs of that population and looking, breaking it down into um, uh, looking at income levels and looking at what might be needed depending on where people are in their um, asset and income level. So, and then finally identifying policy solutions that will align with that. So we are really excited about this body of work. We are in the process of um, thinking through our contract options and hope to have something in place and start our stakeholder engagement this uh, late fall, early winter. So um, that kind of summarizes where we are with this project and these two initiatives. And I'm happy to answer questions if there are time, but Susan, I will turn it to you to see uh, for direction. Great, Sarah, thank you so much. And there is time. So we've got about 10 minutes um, and we'd love to hear from committee members. Uh, any reactions to Sarah's presentation? Any questions, clarification? Fernando, it looks like you have yes a uh, real hand raised. Yes, <laughs> uh, Sarah. Again, thank you. That's just uh, an exciting uh, con conceptual framework that might lead towards real policy solutions. A quick question: uh, To what extent will we be drawing from or learning from the Washington State example as they attempt to come up with their financing policy solution? about that. That's a terrific question, Fernando, and 100% want to learn from Washington and other states in the work that they're doing. So this um, policy analysis will kind of be everything across the spectrum um, of options, including understanding what other states like Washington have done and um, some of the related considerations with that. Kevin. And that's Let's hear from Kevin next. Yeah, I agree with Fernando. The, the framework sounds great. Uh, builds nicely off the work of the LTSS subcommittee, the master plan for aging. So like that consistency. Um, I, I wonder if at this point, Sarah, you have a sense of, are, it, you know, in your mind, what are the top two or three questions that we hope can be answered by this survey or by this whole project? Yes. Now that's a great question, Kevin. I would, uh, just at the top of my mind, I would think first, we want to really understand what the population needs are and understanding, you know, really getting a deep dive into a lot of our work will not just be quantitative data analysis, but also consumer focus groups of understanding what people's needs are and how they're currently financing them, building off of a lot of the great work that has already been done. And that's, I think, something really important to highlight is that there has been a lot of work done in this space. So we want to understand how the work that's been done in this space in other states and in our own state, building off the work of the Milliman study that was completed a few years ago, as well as the work of um, the current long-term care financing task force that's underway through the Department of Insurance, what they have learned, and then really understanding where some policy solutions are that might align with these uh, different population needs. So it might be that there's a multi-pronged 
solution that we present. So it's not just putting all of our eggs in one basket, but looking across Medi-Cal and Medicare systems to understand what some potential solutions might be to meet the needs of the range of the population. So I think initially we really are going to have to focus on understanding our target population and defining the different parts of the target population and recognizing that you can't have one solution that's a silver bullet for everyone. Susan, do you want to add into that? No, that was well said. And I see Kathleen has a question. Welcome, Kathleen. Hi, thank you so much for your presentation. I just wanted to say I was so um, glad to see the connection of transportation um, with accessing long-term care solutions for people. And I was also just curious, um, Sarah, if you could talk a little bit about, you know, we obviously have an extremely diverse state and what the um, sort of uh, research methodology you're using to reach maybe underserved populations, mm -hmm. um, particularly those who aren't um, English language speakers. Absolutely. Thank you, Kathleen, for um, elevating that. And this is where it's going to be critical to uh, engage with partners that can uh, reach and engage those communities across the state so that we need to understand across, uh, you know, all of our populations, um, what a culturally responsive approach might be and understanding what the needs are, because I don't think we can say that anybody at a certain age or a certain income level has all the same needs, um, regardless of their uh, status of medical care or disability, there's a whole set of other circumstances that we need to understand how it impacts their needs. So we intend to uh, contract with entity, either one entity or a series of entities that can uh, have the trust of our local communities and can engage with them in a culturally responsive way to understand their needs. And from there, developing a sense of what the policy solutions might be. And then I see Nancy. Thanks, Sarah. Really appreciate the, the graphic representation of how this work is going to be linking certain things. And appreciate, Kathleen, that you mentioned transportation. Since you did, I won't. But I will um, ask about a little bit more about the DOI, the Department of Insurance work group, and how that is going to inform the work we're doing, because we've been kind of on separate trajectories. Yeah. Thank you. That's such an important question, Nancy, because for those um, listening in, there is an effort that was um, launched through a legislative initiative that the Department of Insurance has been undertaking, where they've done a very comprehensive process with a uh, uh, advisory committee to look at the issue of how the state might consider development of a public benefit for long-term services and supports financing. One thing I do want to note is that we are absolutely learning from that effort right now. And in fact, um, the Department of Aging and the Department of Healthcare Services are, are members of that, but we are non-voting members. So to that extent, what we are doing is providing technical assistance where needed, but also learning from the work that they're doing to inform our work. I will say that um, the administration does not have a position on that effort. Um, we are certainly appreciative of the opportunity to learn from it, and we'll take those learnings to inform the, the body of work that we present um, through this initiative. Other questions for Sarah? Not seeing any. Great. Sarah, thank you. And we will keep you apprised with the gap analysis. There have already been a number of stakeholder meet convenings and webinars, and that will continue. And then, um, like Sarah said, we look forward to the LTSS financing and affordability work to to take off, you know, externally after the first of the year. So all of those public meetings and convenings, you'll you'll hear about those first. Um, so more to come on both of those topics. And now we're a, a little bit ahead of, oh, it looks like we have two participants who raised their hands and we will hold their questions until the public comment period. Is that 
Tony and let's see. Um, Tony and Mark, we will come back to you during the public comment period. Thank you. So now we're going to move to the next agenda item. And Rosie, we see all of your screens right now. <laughs> um, we're going to turn over to Ross. Sarah, did you want to introduce Ross to the group? This may be his first meeting. Absolutely. The impact uh, committee. It is Ross my and Evan are joining us. Terrific. It is my pleasure to uh, introduce you all to our chief of research, Ross Lallian, along with his partner, Evan Wallace, our senior research specialist. We are so pleased to have this team in place to help us uh, develop a proposed framework to measure progress in advancing equity in the master plan for aging. And I will say that um, the feedback from the impact committee has been, it's just super helpful to help us think through how to approach this. We've had the opportunity to speak with a few of you to get some input from you um, on how we develop a framework as was recommended in the impact committee report to the state. Um, and so uh, appreciate these the, the time to kind of think through the approach. And then today, Ross and Evan are gonna walk through this proposed framework in response to your feedback. So welcome Ross and Evan. Thank you, Sarah. Hi, everyone. So we're going to share a proposed framework with you related to how we want to collect equity-related equity data and how we want to use those data to monitor NPA-related progress. And we should have plenty of time for, for Q&A at the end. We have a few slides to, to get through. Um, next slide, please. So we'll start the presentation by going over what types of demographic data that we currently collect and how we make those data available. And then we'll discuss opportunities to kind of build upon our current state of equity data collection. We'll then, we'll then introduce our proposed MPA equity data framework. Evan will describe how we're designing the framework and helps that the data are user friendly and hopefully will lead to that, that policy and program decision making. Um, next slide, please. So starting with our current state, we currently do collect and make available informative demographic data. And our primary kind of public facing tool for all things MPA data is our data dashboard for aging or the DDA. It will be referencing the DDA throughout the presentation because that's the primary platform for us to implement the framework that we'll describe today. It'll be the platform also where we'll in invite our colleagues and stakeholders to access equity data. So on the slide here, you see a screenshot of a visual on the DDA. And the DDA houses data on all the goals and strategies of the MPA. So there's quite a bit of data on there. But this screenshot is from Goal for Strategy A, which is around family and friends caregivers. And expand a drop down titled characteristics on this visual. So that drop down includes many different demographic factors that one could include as part of this visual. So things like race, ethnicity, poverty, immigration status, languages spoken at home, et cetera. And the visuals on the DDA all have a similar format, although the availability of data does vary a bit. So you want to find a consistent set of demographics currently across all the goals and strategies. However, we do try to include as much data as we can. So our current format does give the user the, the ability to customize the visualization with the data they find useful. useful. So I described it as more of a self-serve type of environment. It'll probably be more useful for folks that have some background of the subject matter and data and folks that feel comfortable kind of creating their own takeaways from, from the data as well. Go to the next slide, please. We also house what we call a demographic dashboard on the DDA, and you see a, a screenshot of it on the slide here. So this dashboard includes a lot of data about older adults in the state. If a range of years is selected, the user can access a subset of data at the county level. So things like race, ethnicity, income, there's some SOGI data. But there's quite a bit of data on there. So this, this dashboard is useful for consumers interested in specific demographic data that they can access quickly. It's also designed as more of a self-service type of tool, so we don't provide takeaways or other other insights. It says data at your fingertips, but if a consumer has an idea of what types of data that they're looking for and feels comfortable analyzing the data on their own and kind of drawing their own conclusions, this tool can be really useful. Uh, next slide, please. So in our current state, we have useful data and, and, and tools available. However, there's definitely opportunities for us to improve on the data that we offer and how we offer it and kind of build on our current state. And one of the first things that comes to mind is, is developing the, the ability to quantify and track equity and be able to look at that over time, which is really important for us. So that's different than our current state. We're still going to allow for a lot of that self-service on the DDA because there's definitely a need for that. However, we're going to conduct some analysis before making the, the data public. So it's easier for consumers to understand the context of these data. So it's easier for consumers to understand how the state's performing relative to equity around the goals and strategies of the MPA, 
Our goal is to make it easier for consumers to better understand topics such as racial equity and how it relates to the MPA. Then again, also be able to track that over time to hopefully see the progress that we as a state are, are making. And as, as we've been developing this MPA equity framework, we've been doing so with the consumer in mind, and that's really important to us because we want all of our stakeholders to find value in our DDA and this, this equity framework, not only researchers or, or data folks, right? So, and that's why it's so important for us to provide that context for the consumer. Also, the data that's available currently kind of varies from visual to visual, so we want to add some consistency across the DDA as well. Also, with the, the current as a state, it makes it a bit more challenging for the data on the DDA to be to be actionable. And part of the reason is that the data could be more, more user friendly. We could do some back end work to present the data in, in, in a manner that leads to those policy and program takeaways. And so Evan's been working hard at that and really thinking through how do we present these data in a consumer friendly manner that will lead to action. And I'm looking forward to Evan here and here and sharing some of the detail with you in, in, in a second. Um, and then finally, as I mentioned, we like to have more consistency across not only the DDA, but across other work streams as well. So moving towards this framework will allow for us to be consistent in what types of data we like to collect and how we quantify equity. And everyone will speak to the benefits of, of standardizing these data. That's a game changer for us in terms of how we can use these data, because we'll be able to make comparisons across MPA goals and strategies. We'll be able to compare how the state's performing from a racial equity perspective, for example, on housing supply versus behavioral health accessibility. And so having that consistent framework that we can apply across the MPA, goal, MPA related work streams will lead to more insights and more valuable insights. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Evan, who will describe the equity framework and how we plan on using it. So uh, take the way, Evan. Uh, next slide, please, Rosie. Uh, so as Ross mentioned, we're already collecting a lot of equity related data. Uh, so what we're looking to do is upgrade what we do with that data and how we display it to people. Uh, and again, the goal is to create this framework that creates digestible information that is uh, user-friendly and, and easy to track over time. Uh, so this is a screenshot of what kind of the proposed direction of what the DDA could become. Uh, this one is specifically about uh, having a usual source of care, uh, but there's 40 plus other indicators that we'd like to replicate this for, uh, assuming data is available for them all. Um, but generally in this new direction, we wanna call your attention to three things. The first is the big number at the top, 93.7%. That's the main metric we're tracking in this indicator. But we also want to show you how that how that number varies by geography, which is the map there, and how that number varies with specific populations, which is where equity comes in. Uh, so you see we have kind of an equity panel on the right with different equity topics, uh, age, education, language, poverty. Not a final list of topics, but just some examples for discussion. Um, and one of the ways we can make equity data more digestible is by distilling each of those topics, those equity topics, down into a single number. So if you look at something like race, it just shows the one number, 71. Uh, even though there's seven racial and ethnic groups that go into that, uh, what we're doing is applying some consistent math uh, that compares all those groups to each other and summarizes how different they are from each other. Uh, and again, with a single number. Uh, and so that math is something we want to make sure we get right. Uh, so we're working with some subject matter experts, uh, both researchers and, and equity, or sorry, equity experts, uh, to make sure we're not masking any important variation unintentionally. Um, haven't noticed any red flags yet, but uh, just want to make sure we do our due diligence on the math. Um, so in the next slide, uh, we can talk a little bit more about the actual number that we're working with, the equ equity index number. Uh, it's really important for us. This is a user-friendly number that uh, the most number of people can understand. So we're using a scale, uh, a pretty common scale, the percent scale, zero to 100. Uh, and again, this this number represents the uh, variation between groups uh, in, 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 within a topic. Uh, and so a higher number here indicates more equity, which means there's, there's less variation between the groups. Uh, and a lower number indicates less equity, which means there's a large variation between the groups. Um, so if you were to look at an example of a topic with a high uh, equity index, like education, which has a 90 out of 100, uh, you would expect there to be uh, all of the groups within education to have a pretty similar numbers. Uh, and that is the case if you look at the gray bars on the right, um, whether uh, people with a high school education or, or those with a PhD have very similar numbers, right like around 95%. Um, whereas if you looked at a topic with a low equity index, like say language, which has a 55 out of 100, you would expect a pretty big difference between uh, some of the groups within language, uh, which is actually the case if you look at three bars on the right. Um, people who speak English at home, right around 95%, and those who speak Spanish at home, down way down at 80%. Um, so on the next slide. 
so once we've distilled each of those topics down to a single number, we can then track that single number uh, to see how it's changing over time. Uh, and so we can put it on a line graph like here on the screen. Uh, and if that line is trending upwards, that means the groups are getting closer to each other. Uh, if that line is trending downwards, that means they're getting further away and, and things are getting worse. Uh, and so we can actually set equity targets um, for each topic. So we can say things like, oh, we want a language equity index of 80 or higher. Uh, 80 is just an example. Actual target setting is a whole process in itself, uh, which would be another conversation. Um, but we can set a target for each topic. Uh, and because there are multiple topics we're interested in, we can also have an overall equity target where we want all of the topics, eight out of eight, uh, to have an equity index of above 80 or whatever we set the target to be. Uh, so it kind of creates this, this overall equity uh, equity number. And then next slide. Uh, and then once we've once we've standardized this, we've standardized the set of topics to look at, the set of groups to include within each topic, and we've implemented it at, at scale. It really unlocks this kind of broader assessment uh, of equity across the MPA, where we can do things like take a single topic, like say race ethnicity, race ethnicity. Um, pull out all of the equity uh, indices for, for all of the metrics we're tracking and see where it's lowest, for example. Maybe, maybe it's housing cost burden, maybe it's food insecurity, uh, maybe there's a pattern there between those two. Um, and, and ultimately, it's this data can feed back into a policy, policy recommendations, can inform policy recommendations, things like resource targeting. Uh, and so, yeah, that's, that's the vision. Thanks, Evan. Um, go to the next slide, please, Rosie. So we have one last slide to show with to share with you. And this is about setting context about this equity data framework and how it fits into a larger process. There's a couple of things to consider. This framework is only related to the, the master plan for aging. So we want to implement a framework that's used to better understand equity related to MPA goals, strategies, and work streams. But beyond this framework, there's many other efforts from the state to better understand and quantify equity. We were connected to some of those efforts. However, I just want to be clear that this framework is only related to the MPA. Also, this framework will, of course, not solve everything on its own. This is part of this larger collaborative process. So we'll make the, the data available and provide some analysis that Evan just described. But beyond that, we're going to need to work with you all and, uh, and other valued stakeholders to ensure that we have a consistent understanding of these issues that we're working together and understanding potential solutions as well. And so we view this framework as a critical building block for us to better understand these issues, have data, help communicate these issues and the extent of these issues, then also have data to really help drive our, our decision making. Um, so that was the last slide, and we're going to stop here and open up for questions. Um, we would like to ask if there's a committee member, maybe one or, or possibly two, who'd like to work with Evan and I offline to further flesh out this equity index concept. Evan mentioned the work group that we're kind of standing up. There's quite a bit of nuance to that equity index. There's quite a bit of back end math and stats. So it'd be helpful to dig into more of that detail in a separate conversation. Um, so if you're interested, please let us know. Um, thank you for your time. Thank you so much, Ross. And I'm going to let you field the questions from members of the committee, starting with Kieran. Sure. Thanks. Nice to see you, Ross. And I, uh, you know, we're interested. So count us in. Feel free to reach out if we can help with anything. And I, I don't have a question. I just want to give my appreciation to the team. I think, you know, this we've had an opportunity to talk about this a little bit. I think it's really important work. Um, that you all are doing, and I know it's hard to get it right, and I appreciate all of the process and conversations and time and energy that you've put into that. And also, you know, I don't I don't know if Kim is still here, but I, I hope there's an opportunity for you to share some of this work with that cabinet working group, because I think other departments and agencies would really benefit from seeing your approach as well. So thank you. Thank you, Karen. That's a really good point as well about sharing this framework. Absolutely. Thanks. Um, go ahead, Kevin. See your hand up. Yeah, I wanted to echo appreciation as well. This is uh, really interesting. It seems like a really creative way to um, to come at this. So, so congrats. I, I have a couple questions, and and we're interested in continuing to work with you on this as well, myself or Denny. Um, uh, but I guess to to the kind of point about sharing, I'm wondering if your modeling of the equity scores is based on something that somebody else has tried or whether you're really in new territory here. Um, and then my other set of questions would be around, how do we, what's the process, you, you described sort of the constellation, but what's the process of finding the action items and finding the story that's in the number? 
you know, so like you showed language and you showed it briefly, but it looked like maybe there's a lot of groups doing okay and one group that's really lacking. Um, so how do we find that in the score, right? If the score is low, how do we then dig in and see which communities are the ones that are actually within a, within a category like race really falling behind and then take action there? Is there a chance that some communities might, the score might do well, even if some communities are really falling behind just because you've got so many groups in there together? Um, I'm throwing a lot at you. And then I thought also too, like how do you start to think about intersectional issues across some of the, we just lost Ross, <laughs> Evan, you're up. <laughs> um, how do we think intersectionally about some of the categories that you're tracking in equity that we know have intersectional overlaps? So I think you had one for poverty and you know education and language and race. Um, so obviously some groups are gonna be impacted disproportionately across multiple of those measures. Um, so you may not, I don't expect any answers to all these things. Just curious to hear your thought process as I'm sure you're bumping into these things. Sorry about that. I got kicked out, Kevin, for a few minutes, but I heard your two questions. This is a new kind of methodology. And then how do we find those, those distinct communities, right? And so was there anything else that, that I missed? Uh, and then I was starting to ask about intersectionality too, between the different equity uh, principles you have there, that there's communities that are going to be impacted more than once, right? Education, right, poverty, right. race, yeah. Great questions, Kevin. So the first, the, your your first question, this I think is brand new, and I have to give all the props to Evan here and all the credit to Evan because he really thought this through on his own. Um, and so, Evan, I don't know if you want to comment on that. If there's anything you kind of built off of, or is this all your own kind of original trademark creation? I can't hear you. I'm not much sure if that's my connection or can anyone else hear? Okay. Wanna try again? You er, can't hear you, Evan. You might have to reboot, Evan. I could help answer some of the questions if you want to come back on. And so, Kevin, the other point, I think that's a really critical point, right? In the example Evan showed about languages. It seemed like the most groups are doing well as Spanish speaking folks, right? And so we're going to provide that detail on the DDA so that that type of granularity is going to be on there. And so I think that's going to be really, really critical to be able to like hone in on those, those communities. Intersectionality, your lab, that's, that's such a phenomenal point because we've been kind of struggling with that because I really want that there. And that depends on the, the data, right? There's a lot of different limitations. So I think it's, it's, we keep collecting more granular data. And be able to add that on the DDA. Currently, it's sort of it's aggregated public data. Aggregated, it's, it's at a pretty high level. So as we collect more granular data, I think we're going to find that, that uh, intersectionality, which is a critical piece of this story. So I definitely appreciate that point. Um. So uh, Eric, I see your hand up and a few other hands. So, um, yeah, sorry. thank you so much. Um... Eric Harris with Disability Rights California, and I'm a new member here. Uh, and it's really great to be in a space with so many familiar faces. Um, and I also wanted to echo um, a little bit of what was brought up earlier. Um, equity is certainly uh, a piece that Disability Rights California and um, me personally as a, a Black person with a disability, um, very, very um, important to the work that we do and, and what we focus on and how we think through um, some of this work. Um, a couple of things, and I know you mentioned, uh, you know, previously it was mentioned intersectionality and kind of how we look at the intersection of some of the issues. I also want us to think about the intersection of representation and intersection of identities and how those identities can potentially impact people's experiences, right? So uh, a Black person who's older or a Black person with a disability, um, depending on that disability or depending on their income levels or their neighborhoods or their backgrounds um, can all have a variety of impacts on their experiences. And I think that, that some of that should drive how we collect the data. Um, because sometimes we'll think about um, collecting data in certain categories, but like me, I can't separate myself from being uh, a person with a disability as well as a as a black person. And 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 you know, and I think that it's really, really important that we take those into account as we're collecting the data in the beginning. Um, so that when we're analyzing the data, we can uh, kind of point back to 
oh, these were some groups that had multiple identities and, and multiple intersections. So their experiences with some of these issues um, are going to be particular and unique. And we need to make sure that we're thinking about that um, as we're going through. So it's almost like a like data plus others. So like plus the unique experiences that individuals have. And so that's one thing that I'm really looking forward to with this group is um, is getting a uh, perspective from individuals and from specific groups of people uh, to know how their experiences are that might be unique uh, compared to others. Um, so I really look, I'm really looking forward uh, to working with you all on this. Thank you, Eric. I think qualitative data is a big piece of the story. What we show today is more quantitative based, um, but yeah, qualitative data and telling that story, that's going to be critical. We'd love to fold that into the, the DDA as we flesh this process out. Thanks. I'm um, did you want to go back to what you were saying? If we could hear you now. Still can't hear you, unfortunately. So um, it's okay. Well, go ahead, Linda. See your hand up. Thanks. And I, I just want to un unmute it, um, echo uh, the excitement and appreciation for this. Um, I think you might have touched on this with some of the data limitations and aggregation of data, uh, but wonder how consistent these data fields are across different areas. I'm thinking, for example, on the, the language example, um, is this um, our um, recognizing um, with Medi-Cal, the Medi-Cal threshold languages that that can vary based on county and so forth. And so thinking about um, the, the consistency across the data, but also wanting to be as granular to your point as possible for, for much of um, the, the data. Thanks for that. Um, appreciate that question, Linda. So currently we use a variety of data sources. So it depends on the actual data source, but I think a big, uh, it's a, a big priority for Evan and I is getting more granular data. And I've mentioned that a couple of times, because intersectionality is going to be critical because right now we don't have data on all the medical threshold languages, for example. I think there, there's like 11 or 12 of them. So we have data about six or seven languages. We want to get more granular. So that's our goal. So we start looking for, for more data sources. And as we meet with the, these different work groups, the equity index work group, for example, looking forward to having those conversations as well. Thank you. Go ahead, Nancy. Thank you. Um, very exciting to see the development of this and really appreciate your comment on really looking to make this consumer friendly so that the average person can really understand what's being measured and what the outcomes are. My question is more, um, and Ross, this may be a little bit more for Susan um, along with you, is as you come up with findings and how is this translated, both research and data into strategic approaches that the different agencies are implementing? And then how do you, measure um, what strategies are changing or improving desired outcomes because data is data, right? We have to do something with that. What are we thinking? That's a great question, Nancy. I can start off, Susan, I'll hand it over to you. So the, this first example that comes to mind is MPA key outcomes, Nancy. And I don't know if I've talked to you about that yet. We're developing outcome measures to be able to track the progress of MPA-related goals and strategies. And this equity framework is going to come is going to be critical to that because we want to develop equity goals as well. And we're working with the, with the cross section of folks on these these MPA key outcomes, aging and disability research partnership. But for us to be able to understand where those equity gaps really are, those priority gaps, and be able to dig in on those and share those data with our our colleagues and stakeholders across Health and Human Services Agency, um, that's going to be really critical. And then Susan, I don't know if you want to expand on that. No, that that's that is the question of the the hour, Nancy. That's the purpose behind all of this is to really drive um, policy, uh, funding, decisions, programs. And I can give a great example. Um, you heard, you know, that Evan has trademarked <laughs> these um, the equity scores, but uh, the Administration for Community Living has op um, had a public notice of pro proposed rulemaking for all of for the Older Americans Act. Um, for the first time since the 1980s, they had a public rulemaking process uh, that just closed about a month ago. And all AAAs, area agencies on aging in our state are asked 
as part of the Older Americans Act to serve people with the greatest economic and social need. And it's kind of vague. And um, Calif you know, here in our state, we wanted to be able to measure that. And so we're working with Ross and Evan and it's close to completion, um, a composite equity score by county. You know, We're able to get it to the county level where we're looking at, I think, um, 11 or 12 data sets that we can drive how we resource our AAA network because the population has changed dramatically over the 50 years since we first organized our AAA network and since the 1980s when we last had the rulemaking. So if we're going to fund the AAAs to provide the work that truly meets people with the greatest economic and social need, we need to know where they reside and who they are. Um, so getting it to the county level is is a huge win for us. And we know we can go even you know more granular ultimately to the zip code level. So that's that's just one example. Um, but there are many, many more and it's new. So, you know, we can't point to, you know, that's the best example I have of where it's been used in real time to drive something. Um, it also will influence our older adult behavioral health. As we, you know, as I mentioned at the opening of the meeting, $30 million in, in grants to community-based organizations, you know, we will be able to overlay um, the state of California where the greatest needs are and be able to hopefully incentivize grant making in those areas. And with that, Ross and Evan, thank you both so much for your great work. Please stay on with us. And I see that our 11 o'clock guest has joined us. I'm so happy to welcome Stephanie Welch to our meeting. And Stephanie's going to provide all of us with an update on where things are in the behavioral health space. It's been a very, very busy summer. Um, and Stephanie, welcome so much. Welcome and thanks so much for being with us today. Yeah. Hi, everyone. I'm not sure if I've been here before uh, with this particular group. Um, I'm um, happy to be here and um, wanted to uh, just give a quick update probably on the on the most kind of pressing new behavioral health initiative that we have that's a pretty significant proposed reform. Um, and I do think I provided you all a, a, a slide deck that actually, Susan, I think is far too dense for us to go through today, but I'd like to make sure that you guys all receive a copy of it. We also um, basically recorded that uh, a presentation uh, takes about an hour to watch, um, and it it is that slide deck. And so, would really encourage people to check that out on our website. And when I stop talking, Susan, I'll make sure I put the direct link in there that's on our agency website, where folks can um, find the webinar as well as download the slides. Um, uh, so, I think in the time that I have today, I just want to kind of touch on some of the the highlights of the proposal. Um, uh, not not really familiar with how much this particular audience um, is aware of um, or is knowledgeable of the Mental Health Services Act, but um, there really are two different pieces of legislation that now have been combined and that will be on the March ballot as Prop 1, and that is SB 326. That is the vehicle for changes to the current Mental Health Services Act and AB 531, which is a bond to build um, community uh, facilities, treatment facilities, as well as residential care settings, um, as well as permanent supportive housing. So I will take them separately. Um, and um, I think the other thing I would say about the series of presentations that are available on the website, there are four different, or I'm sorry, excuse me, there are three different webinars that are posted on that webpage. I think the first one starts in June. Um, and um, basically the purpose of the webinars have been to uh, brief our stakeholders on significant amendments that were taking place to what is a very, very large 200 plus page bill. Um, and so we do think it's a little bit confusing because now that we're through the whole process and the legislature has elected to send uh, both bills to the governor, um, 
uh, I think we'll also be putting together a new, shorter, briefer presentation that kind of hits the highlights of what is in the reform package. I'm going to do that for you verbally today and hope that we have plenty of time for a few questions. Um, First and foremost, with the modernization package, which I think is being repackaged uh, with talking points as a reform proposal, um, really is intended to modernize the Mental Health Services Act. Um, when we embarked on, on this effort uh, earlier this year, we really looked at the totality of a variety of different investments that had been made in the behavioral health space um, and felt that it was time to take a um, a piece of legislation that was written 20 years ago and to make sure that it was leveraging um, to the best of its ability every dollar that we had so that all Californians would have better access to behavioral health care. And so, you know, in the 20 years since the Mental Health Services Act was written, I would say hands down the most significant change in our behavioral health system was the Affordable Care Act, both expanding Medicaid to um, low income individuals, uh, but more importantly, creating something that we call the essential health benefits. Those essential health benefits require uh, Medicaid managed care plans to provide um, uh, services, um, basic uh, substance use and mental health services. And all of that really means is that we went from a system 20 years ago, frankly, that was a healthcare system that did not include uh, proper treatment for mental health and substance use disorders to a system today that our, our Medicaid system today, our Medi-Cal system here in California, is a much more robust set of, of services than even our commercial commercial plans provide when it comes to behavioral health. And so that is another part that doesn't really get talked about because it's not actually in the bill package. But one of the major things that we will be working on in the course of the next couple of years will be, and we've already started to do it, um, doing that analysis of all the different services that people um, are required to have as part of uh, being a, a commercial beneficiary under our parity program, and then those that are provided through Medi-Cal. And I would have to say in my 25 years of doing this, the last five years, we've stretched what we could even possibly imagine Medi-Cal could do uh, to uh, the limits that we want to take it, you know, really addressing the social determinants of health, doing really exciting, innovative things like paying for transitional rent, um, uh, trying to really uh, propel uh, services and, and approaches that um, started as community um, defined, uh, community defined evidence practices um, that we're trying to scale um, at across the entire state um, uh, with things like our Promodoras program and soon to be our uh, first break, uh, first episode psychosis program through our Behavior Health Connect. And so all of that to say that um, whether it be you know, we're talking about the Behavioral Health Infrastructure Program or the Children and Youth Behavioral Health Initiative or CalAIM and all of our um, Medicaid reforms, um, some of the major workforce investments that we've been making, um, that was all a critical work to do, but at the end of the day, the Mental Health Services Act still represents a quarter, if not a third in some of our smaller counties of their overall budget to fund the public community mental health system. And so we felt it was time to make sure that that tool, that really essential tool, um, is being used to the best of its ability now that we have other funding sources that can cover costs that never were able to cover costs before when the Mental Health Services Act was imagined. So, so some of the major changes to the Mental Health Services Act is uh, probably the most notable is that we are proposing to change the name to the Behavioral Health Services Act and to be inclusive of, of providing treatment to people with primary substance use disorders. Um, uh, I'd have to say that this is, um, as someone who worked on the original Prop 63 as a young, young, much younger person, um, it's really, uh, the time has most certainly come, it's long overdue to treat people with substance use disorders and give them access to services um, in, in an equal and frankly more just way uh, is being included in our Mental Health Services Act. So very excited about, about that uh, addition. Um, 
And uh, one of the other kind of major changes um, that has gotten, I think, a lot of, of people's attention would be the new kind of categorical funding uh, bucket that requires uh, funds be spent on housing interventions. So um, that is really recognizing that for people who are the most vulnerable, people who who have the most the highest treatment needs, um, unfortunately, they're also in many cases experiencing extreme poverty um, and lack of access to a variety of other social supports. Um, that these are individuals who need um, ongoing uh, support to live in the least restrictive environment, hopefully in the most independent community integrated environment. And that means we have to pay for housing interventions, everything from rental subsidies to operating subsidies to um, uh, uh, patches for uh, to cover the cost uh, if someone's uh, social security or other uh, income resources do not uh, meet the standards that they would need to meet in order to live in a particular uh, enriched uh, community residential uh, facility. And I say facility, it's really tricky um, because some people for periods of their illness may be so uh, maybe so unwell that they have to live in a community residential setting. So they are quote unquote living there, but it's not a home, it's not a house. And so I think um, the goal is to uh, obviously have as many people as possible live independently on their own or with their families or with their loved ones, roommates, et cetera. But I think we recognize that for many people, unfortunately, that is not the situation for a period of time. Um, and uh, we've had lots of conversations about just the, the the, uh, in many cases, just complete uh, unavailability of, of any kind of a treatment facility and also for affordable low-income housing. Um, we think for some of our population, even if we're able to make incredible inroads and, and have more affordable housing in the state, we may always need to have a supplemental rental subsidy so that that individual can live in, freely in their community um, and not be at risk of, of some sort of uh, institutionalization or being unfortunately becoming um, housing in, unstable or, or, or unhoused. Um, I think the other kind of really big component that doesn't get a lot of airplay because it's probably not super uh, Super interesting, and frankly, it's not even that easy to grasp, but it really is a significant overhaul of the accountability mechanisms that are associated with the public, the publicly funded community uh, behavioral health system. And I say that because um, there's this really robust uh, community planning process that was new and novel and has been the cornerstone of what has made the Mental Health Services Act special, um, frankly. Um, and we are expanding that process to open up the dialogue about other funding sources so that stakeholders um, can have can have an, a, a, an adequate picture, so to speak, a full picture, a full array of the various different funding sources that go into the public mental health system um, while they're making their planning decisions around their new, newly proposed behavioral health services dollars. So for example, it's really hard to say, oh, we wanna invest this to address this SUD issue when you're only looking at a quarter of the money that's going into the overall system. Um, it makes a lot more sense to probably look at all of the resources going in. What is realignment paying for? What is Medi-Cal paying for? What are other maybe county categorical funds paying for? Um, to tell the full story of how the behavioral health continuum in one particular community or county is being resourced. Um, are there a lot of resources going into uh, long-term uh, uh, IMDs? Maybe that's, I mean, that's not even necessarily a conversation that can take place right now at the community level. It's not data that is available. So I think, um, and I also really think our county partners um, have welcomed this. They want to have a more thorough conversation with their community about how to spend these resources and to spend them wisely. And so there's lots of details in the slides about some of the specifics on how we're going to, um, what's required at the local level, but it really is a much more robust 
group of stakeholders as well. And I would say for this group, uh, we were very cognizant to make sure that um, local areas of aging, regional centers, um, advocates for uh, children and youth who may be um, being served um, in, the, in similar systems, that they're at the table as well in these conversations. Um, and as you may see, if, if some of you would have taken the time to read the whole bill, it's very long. There's a lots of, of, of mention of um, some of the unique needs of older adults in particular. Um, the challenges that older adults have in finding stable housing, obviously our growing population of aging adults with serious mental illness is a, is a concern of, of ours. And so we really want this to be um, a data-driven planning process as well. And so it'll be really important to have um, uh, the perspective of people who are knowledgeable about people with um, uh, our, our aging population, as well as people uh, living with um, disabilities, being in those conversations uh, at the local level. Um, that being said, there also are some significant accountability changes at the state level. Um, it was uh, very clear to us early on that our idea about bringing um, the Oversight and Accountability Commission into our health and human services agency so that they could really be a think tank and a thought partner with us was not something that the legislature felt was appropriate. They much preferred them to have their independence um, from the administration. Um, so we were very responsive to that, understood that. Um, and I would really encourage people to take a look at some of the changes that were made to the to the Mental Health or now Behavioral Health Oversight and Accountability Commission, or shall I say proposed. Um, there is a much more robust membership, obviously, to be reflective of the inclusion of SUD, but also membership from uh, an organization that represents um, uh, people uh, who are knowledgeable about aging or disability. We've added more seats for uh, transition age youth, for education. Um, I think more important than all the quote unquote seats is um, really another thing that kind of happened towards the end of the amendment cycle, but is really significant. And we actually um, made some uh, adjustments to the overall purpose of the Behavioral Health Services Oversight and Accountability Commission. And so I want to just, because I know you guys have a partnership with them, um, I want to just lift up that they um, their purpose has been updated to specifically say um, to promote transform transformational change in California's behavioral health system through research, evaluation, and tracking outcomes, and other strategies to assess and report progress, um, and that they will use this information to inform their grant making, to identify key policy issues and best practices, to provide training and technical assistance, and to promote high quality programs. Um, so I think um, really excited about what that means about having another um, critical partner to to drive change, really. And we are certainly putting a significant amount of change on our behavioral health system. Um, so those are some of the, I mean, it's very, there's, I could talk all day, honestly, uh, with, with a piece of legislation that's over 200 pages, but that's those are some of the really uh, broad highlights. Um, I think uh, with the bond um, at, you know, um, there was a lot of advocacy from a lot of groups towards the end of the legislative process that really recognized that this was a, a unique opportunity to be able to go to the voters with a bond. And we were, um, in my opinion, lucky enough to get another $1.5 billion added to the bond in the last week of the legislative process. Um, now, that $1.5 billion uh, led to two significant changes in the way that the bond was structured. The first, uh, the first being that now there was an actual, now there would be, excuse me, an actual set aside just for counties, cities, and tribes. So that $1.5 billion is a set aside for counties, cities, and tribes with the thinking that because counties are doing the behavioral health continuum infrastructure program now, that they're best um, suited to move rapidly to utilize those dollars. The other major significant change was that um, instead of um, uh, focusing on two areas of which, that we have identified as continued significant unmet needs through our behavioral health uh, needs assessment that we conducted a few years ago and other various different surveys that we've done with counties, 
um, as well as some other reporting and, and, and such. There was the choice to um, utilize an existing program, the Behavioral Health Continuum Infrastructure Program, to be the um, kind of implementation program for the bond. Um, at least the bond part that's building behavioral health treatment facilities. Um, the Housing and Community Development Department will still be responsible for overseeing the implementation of the permanent supportive housing component. And the California Veterans Affairs Department will still be um, working in partnership for the set aside for um, uh, for our veterans and their housing needs. Um, but for us, I'm trying to think if I have the number right in front of me, um, we will have uh, 4.4, about $4.4 .4 billion for the Behavioral Health Continuum Infrastructure Program. Um, and that program, I think, would be, uh, if you're not familiar with it, this group, um, specifically, I'll just read what is referenced in the statute. Uh, the BCHIP program is funding to construct, acquire, and rehabilitate real estate assets or to invest in needed infrastructure to expand the continuum of behavioral health treatment resources to build new capacity or expand existing capacity for short-term crisis stabilization, acute and subacute, crisis residential, community-based me mental health residential, substance use disorder residential, peer respite, community and outpatient behavioral health services, and other clinically enriched longer-term treatment and rehabilitation options for persons. All of these have to be in the least restrictive and least costly setting. Um, I know that was a mouthful. Oh, thank you. There. Thank you very much. Uh, it was a mouthful, but a lot of people don't know what this program is. Um, uh, and we will really have to um, if we're if we're if the bond passes and the, and that's the will of the voters, then uh, we'll have to do some more thinking about um, where to focus uh, those opportunities because we have such tremendous need ac across our entire behavioral health continuum. So, so the bond now I forgot to give you guys the total, but the bond now is six point four billion dollars. Um, and so really a substantial amount of money um, going into uh, trying to resolve some of these issues. So there's so much we could talk about. And I know we I really want to be able to at least try to answer a couple of questions. Um, uh, I think the last thing that I would say, is, just so I'm not remiss, um, it really was our intent. And I think that we still have maybe some work to do, but it really was our intent, whether it be in the accountability section or in language throughout the changes uh, to the Mental Health Services Act, to use this as an opportunity to aggressively reduce disparities. Um, I would say ethnic, racial, uh, disparities across the board, including age, culture, LGBTQ, I could even say rural versus urban and suburban, uh, the just tremendous uh, geographic disparities that exist, speaking of infrastructure issues. Um, there's also a significant ongoing workforce investment that'll be critical to get your expertise on as we move forward, since we really, frankly, do not have the the type of workforce to serve our future population, our aging population with, with um, behavioral health issues. And so those are just, um, I guess in summary here, Susan, I would say that your expertise and eyes moving forward on how to make the most of this bond. How do we make the most of our ongoing resources for uh, the workforce, and really notably, and you will see in the in when you get a chance to dive into the details of the report, older adults are referenced in several areas. Um, life transitions mean different things, right? We we really have to be aggressive and do early intervention when people are having those life transitions, including aging, um, losing a loved one. Um, uh, we also have a population-based prevention piece. And I think that that's also something we all know, the incredibly high rates of suicide amongst the aging population. We also are well aware of, of unfortunately, the, the successful completion rates of suicide for older men in particular. So lots of work that needs to be done to bring attention to some of the issues that you guys are also knowledgeable about um, and hope that you stay really engaged um, in how things progress. And thank you very much, Amanda, for putting the page up there for me.
Stephanie, thank you. That's a whirlwind uh, presentation on something you've been working uh, your entire career toward and um, in recent months around the clock. So I just want to thank you for your dedication uh, to SB 326 and AB 531 and all the associated pieces of it. Um, I know how hard you and so many others have worked um, in the administration, in the legislature and stakeholders too. So thank you so much. Doing a quick time check here and Amanda is going to make sure the slides are available to everyone. They'll show up on your invitation. So you'll be able to access um, all of Stephanie's slides. What we're going to do here is we can take at least two questions for Stephanie. Then Kevin's going to lead a conversation with um, MPA committee members and we'll take public comment. Um, it's scheduled for 1145. Uh, so we'll do our very best to start the public comment at 1145. Do I see any questions for Nancy? You're first out of the gate. Thanks, Susan. Stephanie, such a Herculean effort and just amazing what can be accomplished with this. Very curious about how you staff up really quickly for real estate assessment, for acquisition of properties, and for construction. Do you form a new unit? You know, what happens to make this move really quickly? Um, I love, let's just, I'm only, I'm smiling because yes, uh, uh, I have been known in my, in my little world here to, to kind of call this like, it's like a, it's like building a startup. Um, the, one of the major reasons the legislature in particular wanted us to use the BCHIP program is that it's an established program. Um, uh, we worked really hard to create the guidance for it, um, the process. I think some of uh, the BCHIP program is anyone can apply private uh, private or as well as nonprofit, as well as county and government. And I think we've learned a lot of lessons um, in that. I still think it's going to be a Herculean effort. I am not going to, uh, I'm not going to sugarcoat that. Um, and we have a, I think something that I'm always cognizant of and um, always am very open to people passing along exam examples of this happening because the more information we have, the better, but we, we really have a serious NIMBY issue. I certainly um, experienced it uh, going through this process. Um, and there's just so much education out there that has to be provided. Um, uh, just so many deep concerns about people um, who are in need of care and treatment not being cared for in the communities that they live in. And so we're going to have to keep working really hard to push back on that nimbyism and, and that belief um, that people who have behavioral health conditions, um, you know, can't, can't live freely. Um, you know, I always say that, that most people on conservatorship are not living in locked facilities. They're living in communities that we all live in. And so just got to continue to put that message out there and make sure that we're all advocating to have these types of facilities and housing in the communities we live in as well. Be very interested in the communications plan that comes out of it. And certainly the population we serve, AARP, um, we would be happy to take a look at what kind of education you're wanting to get out. Thank you. Thank you for that offer, Nancy. We'll take the final question from Kieran. And we debated um, about whether to put this on the agenda today um, because things are still unfolding. Um, but I thought it was so important that we covered this topic in real time. And we will definitely come back to it at our next impact committee meeting. Um, so Kieran, let's hear from you. Yeah, thanks, Susan. Thanks, Stephanie. And I know Stephanie knows our all of our thoughts on this particular initiative, and I appreciate um, your engagement working with us and other stakeholders. But I think, um, you know, be, because this is a public meeting focused on the topics we want to focus on here, I do want to lay out there, there are some really significant concerns from us and others about this modernization or reform, or I'm not sure what the current messaging is. And I would say for us, particularly from a racial disparities perspective, and, and we did um, you know, I think we agree that there's really important changes needed to the system, but at the same time, I think if we are not specific and intentional about looking at racial disparities, and in the previous conversation for this group, we just talked about the importance of intersectionality, right? And, 
you know, unfortunately, the proposal is fairly nonspecific when it comes to racial disparities. There are one or two mentions that we were successful in working with you and your colleagues in the governor's office. But really, largely, I think we have a, a fear that if we are not specific about racial equity and that intersection of um, aging and racial equity, too, that's not what's going to happen at the local level and in implementation. And we have such serious, deeply embedded racial inequities and injustices when it comes to behavioral health and when it comes to homelessness, and particularly when it comes to older adults experiencing homelessness, right? So I think my sort of ask for you in this group would be if if there's a way that we can work with you around really the plan, if this is passed by the voters, on how at the administrative uh, sort of level, we can ensure that racial disparities and again, that intersection of race and age Aging is really meaningfully addressed through, through guidance, through other levers that you all have in your various departments and agencies. And if that is something that can be done, that can be specific, actionable, public, transparent, all those things, I think that would be really helpful. And then Susan, I don't want to mess up the agenda, but I just want to say, I think if Eric wants to say anything on this topic, it would be really important to hear from the disability perspective too. Um, so, but I know you said one more speaker, so I leave it to you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Karen. I'm so happy to indulge our new member, Eric Harris. Please, Eric. <laughs> Thank you so much, Karen. And, and I uh, don't want to add too much. Um, I think that uh, we've been uh, in communication um, with Stephanie's team and with others in the legislature um, who are working on uh, mental health and mental health modernization. Um, of course, DRC has been very vocal um, about um, our concerns and and kind of our our general issues with um, any type of uh, mental health policy without making sure that we're including um, in leadership roles uh, people with lived experience, especially people who are at the intersections of race um, and and gender. Uh, when we're talking about coming up with these policies and making sure um, that they want uh, the types of policies that that we're thinking about, um, a lot of the peer organizations and peer groups um, within the state uh, have been uh, unified in expressing concerns about not just this policy, but others um, in the recent past. And we want to make sure that DRC um, and, and others throughout the state um, are being heard when, uh, when we're expressing the same concerns that mental health peers with lived experience are expressing with these types of major significant policies that are really expensive and really going to change a lot uh, of what the state is doing and how the state does things. Um, so um, I look forward to to kind of lifting those issues up and, and thank you, Karen, for, for mentioning those and, and, and mentioning my name as well. Thank you, Eric. And Stephanie, thank you. Oh, were you going to? Yeah, I was just, no, I was just going to say we welcome working with you guys. I mean, this is going to be a beast to implement if it's the will of the voters to move forward with these changes. And so um, there is endless amounts of work to be done on metrics, on guidance, on there's a whole state auditors process that I didn't mention that would provide another layer of oversight just to make sure that what we're attempting to do is being done and we're getting it right. I'm kind of, you know, that's a, that's a good thing. I think we were, we were really excited to work on that proposal in collaboration with the legislature um, because it's a big change. And when we make big changes, um, they don't always, the outcomes are not uh, locked in stone. So um, I really appreciate everybody's interest in the topic and look forward to you know, your expertise when, when the time comes. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you, Stephanie, for being here and for your great work. Um, and just a small aside is the Behavioral Health Task Force has just um, done a refresh in, in light of the, the big changes coming. They've retooled the Behavioral Health State Behavioral Health Task Force. And I'm pleased that I was uh, just named to that. So that's, you know, one, all of those um, members will be announced. I know that my I was told, but I haven't seen the list of everybody. So that's another forum for stakeholders uh, where much of this will be um, playing out is with the Behavioral Health Task Force. So Kevin, yeah. I'm so happy you're back from your um, sabbatical. I don't know if you're happy to be back from your sabbatical, but um, 
I'll turn it over to you now to lead the rest of the discussion. And no, it's definitely wonderful to be back and to be with all of you. Um, and so we were uh, wanted to take some time to talk about priorities for 2024. And we thought that the best um, way to do that would be in welcoming our new members to the impact committee. Um, we've got a great group, um, people who are steeped in aging and disability and healthcare issues, racial justice issues, economic justice issues, um, have been following the MPA and are bringing new perspectives and experience and expertise to the group. Um, so we wanted to give each of them a little bit of time to talk about um, their views on the MPA and priorities that they have for 2024 and how those align with the priorities that the impact committee has been setting to date, which have included um, you know, a strong focus on many of the topics we touched on today, uh, building our LTSS system, addressing elder homelessness, uh, advancing equity through everything that happens in the master plan for aging. So uh, each of them is going to take a few minutes to reflect on, on all that from, again, their unique perspectives. And we're going to start with Eric Harris. Great. Thank you so much, Kevin. And it's uh, wonderful to be here and, and be a part of this group. Uh, my name is Eric Harris. Uh, I use he, him pronouns, and I'm uh, at Disability Rights California, um, and I'm replacing uh, Andy Imperato, our executive director, who um, served on this committee. I was on the Disability and Aging Community Living Advisory Committee and one, was one of the co-chairs for the last couple of years, and so uh, so I'm, I'm really uh, glad to still uh, be involved in this work. It's a really high priority for um, our organization and myself. Um, and I'm also um, on the State Independent Living Council um, as a gubernatorial appointee and uh, on the Interagency Council on Homelessness. So um, all these issues um, that you brought up are, are really, really crucial. And I, I just want to highlight uh, one in particular um, equity is is one that that is a big highlight for me um, and for the work that Disability Rights California does. I'm really glad um, that it is a focus um, in this first meeting, in this first conversation, because um, I really see equity as a, a crucial piece um, in any uh, work that we do um, to help older adults um, and individuals with disabilities. Um, and how we think about equity. Um, I know that it's been a kind of hot topic of conversation, if you will, in a whole bunch of different organizations and at different levels of government. But I think we really need to look at what equity actually means and what the outcomes are um, when we um, put forward um, our efforts to really have an impact on equity. So I really look forward to working on it. And I'm glad to be um, here with this group. I think that um, Impact has done a lot of really great things, and the Master Plan for Aging um, has has moved us in the right direction as a state. Uh, really grateful for um, the governor and, and all the legislature for the work that they've been doing uh, to uplift um, older adults and their experiences, and I look forward to helping out in any way that I can. Thanks, Eric. Um, so we're going to bring Linda in next. Hi again, uh, Linda Way with uh, Western Center on Law and Poverty. We're a statewide anti-poverty organization, and through the lens of economic and racial justice, we work on health, housing, public benefits, and access to justice, and I work specifically on health. I uh, want to uh, appreciate the opportunity to serve on this committee. Um, and it and and the staff's work so far. Um, also appreciate the focus on uh, the three priorities and agree with all, um, especially uh, the focus on homeless prevention as a key strategy to address the significant rise in older adult homelessness. Um, would recommend looking closer at emergency rental assistance and the need for adequate funding in both the the short and long term. Um, and also want to uplift um, the committee's request to include uh, SSI SSP grant um, in future initiatives, um, which uh, despite recent increases uh, is still below the, the federal poverty level. And so look forward uh, to uh, continuing to, to serve on this committee and we'll pass it to, I think, Eric Dowdy. 
Hi, everyone. Uh, the other Eric on the committee, uh, Eric Dowdy. I'm the vice president of policy for uh, the Alzheimer's Association. I've been with the organization just over a year. Uh, before that, I was with Le Leading Age California, uh, where I was there about 25 years working on uh, senior uh, living and care uh, issues. So in this, uh, to be brief, I'll just say that we are in alignment with many of the, if not all of the areas of the master plan. I think the one area that calls out for highlight is affordability. Uh, our advocates time and time again talk about the uh, cost of care and how high it is, uh, especially somebody suffering from Alzheimer's or dementia. Um, and the availability. I think you see vast areas of the state where there is nothing. Uh, <laughs> so we would love to see a focus on um, a, a more readily available services for folks suffering from Alzheimer's. And uh, as we always have said, I think in the last 20 years that I've been working on this is the no wrong door approach. How do you access services? Um, and, and paying for them um, is a huge priority. And also the LTSS financing area that we've been talking about. I think that's another key issue for us to um, make sure that we get that across the finish line somehow. I know there might be an incremental step we can take, but um, I think moving in that direction with a long-term uh, financing plan for California or the country would be very, very important uh, for our constituency. So, and I'm very honored to be on this, the impact committee. So thank you for having me. Thank you, Eric. Um, and the, our last new member is Kathleen Sullivan, who's been able to join us to listen today, but isn't feeling well enough to, to chime in. So we'll make sure um, that we hear from her in a future meeting. Um, but those are really, uh, you know, a continuation of priorities we've been putting in front of uh, CDA and, and the governor's office and the legislature. Um, as you can see, a lot of consistency, even as we add new members, which I think speaks to um, how much resonance there is in the community for the topics that we've been focused on, LTSS, older homelessness, and, and equity issues. Um, we do have a couple of minutes for other of the impact community members, those that are continuing their service, uh, Fernando or Sharon or Nancy or um, Sarita, I think is on, but also not in a great position to, to contribute. But if any of you would like to add anything else. This is a, uh... This is Fernando. It's just great to have this uh, new members on our committee and uh, we'll be going forward and uh, keeping the momentum. Well, that's it from us, Susan. All right, thank you. Thank you all. And um, you were all selected for a reason. So I, it was good to hear part of the reason um, in your own voices. And we really look forward to working with you. This is a little bit of, you know, the lull time where, it, it, in fact, as soon as this meeting ends, we're having our first meeting about the MPA annual report. So we're starting that outline. Um, as you know, that's due to the legislature in January of every year. So we're gonna start work on the annual report which then starts the cycle with you where you uh, review the report and, and give us feedback. And, um, you know, I think Ross's presentation today is, is reflective of the feedback we heard from you in, in the spring about an equity framework. And so this, this dialogue is so important to us and um, just keep talking, just keep talking and we'll keep listening. Um, I'm going to share in the chat too. I wanted to thank Sarita for the opinion piece that she um, had in Capital Weekly yesterday and make sure everybody gets to see that. Um, I also wanted to just note it was almost exactly a year ago to the day that we were together for the California for All Ages and Abilities Day of Action. And we're thrilled that our foundation partners, our generous and faithful foundation partners, have committed to doing um, a, a similar event next year. We're tentatively looking at October 8th for that to happen. So you'll be the first to hear. Um, it works really well to have that when the budget's signed, when the bills have been signed, so we know what the landscape looks like. And then it's it's just key in developing our next round of initiatives. So it is not, you know, as Kim McCoy Wade said, it is not too early to be thinking about the next round of MPA initiatives. And we hope to get more precise in our language 
you know, with each iteration, you know, more specific and more concrete. So thank you all. We've reached the point in the agenda where we open um, up for public comment. And Carol, will you be leading us in that? I will. Uh, here is the public comment slide. Good afternoon. Thank you for sticking with us. Uh, we will be going into public comment. Uh, if uh, attendees on the phone would like to uh, leave a comment, please press star nine on your dial pad to join the line and uh, we will put you in the queue and unmute your line. Attendees joining by the webinar in the Zoom can click their raised hand button and uh, we will unmute your line. And of course, you may leave us comments at any time at our email box at engage at aging.ca.gov. So I am not seeing any raised hands at the moment. Oh, Tanaya. Tanaya, you... Yeah, I just wanted to know, will we have the material available on the website or on, or will you guys email us? I'm sorry, can you say that one more time, please, Tanaya? Can you repeat what you asked? I said, like, for the material for today, I know um, the other lady mentioned that we should go to the website. It will be available in some recording. Will we have any of those things available after the training, after the meeting today? I. Uh, Give us a few days, but they will be um, uh, posted to the Cal HHS website. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. Any other public comments during this period? Attendees by phone can press star nine. Uh, attendees via webinar can click the raise hand button to. And we have one from Et Sotnik. I'm unmuting your line. Go ahead. You can unmute yourself. Yeah, I did send a couple of things to the question and answer. Um, uh, you know, Sometimes when we think of family impact, senior citizens, we're thinking of one family member, but in my case, I have a disabled brother-in-law and a disabled sister who are going through a crisis right now. Um, my main question is, we are the forgotten middle. My mother's care, she's in memory care now. She was diagnosed with Alzheimer's in 2020. Um, she will go broke. We will be going broke. Even at home, it was costing us six thousand dollars a month, cobbling together different caregivers. Um, but we couldn't get her to eat. We couldn't get her to take her meds. We weren't getting behavioral support. So, and and my brother's my brother in law's situation is a bit different. He's quadriplegic, and what we find most frustrating is that. We don't, I, I, I'm encouraged what I hear about the no wrong door um, because this is part of the frustration. Every organization we call sends us somewhere else or tells us there are no resources for you. We're not either rich enough or poor enough um, to get resources. And then my mother has Kaiser, so they don't like to pay for things. Uh, they won't pay for my mother to get a flu shot at her memory care. I just find a lot of the, the the things that I need aren't happening now. And maybe it's because I don't know where those resources are, or maybe they still don't exist. And I'm just knocking my head. So I'm just, I guess, needing some advice. I'm very encouraged at all the hard work that you do. I'm, I'm a retired public school teacher. So I feel like, I, and I used to do Medi-Cal work. So I am definitely um, happy to see our state take care of our senior citizens. I just need to, I just need help now. <laughs> you know? So do you have a, like a place to direct me or is there anything I need? Maybe I've missed. Is 
Sarah, Sarah, why do you, well, first of yeah, all, I was just we're so glad that, that you're here. We're so glad that you're here mm-hmm. today. And we would like to include you in our LTSS financing and affordability work because the story you're describing, <laughs> um, we want to uplift your family's story because that's the problem we're trying to solve. But Sarah, if you could direct. Um, yep, I will do so. I just. Assistance. Yes, I just got your email. Thank you so much. And we will set up a time to talk. And as Susan said, I think your story really touches on, you know, where I talked about the four prongs of financing, access, navigation, and workforce, all of this together. So I'm happy to talk to you and try and troubleshoot, at least for the time being, and then engage you in this work moving forward. Thank you. I would love, I would love that. Okay. Thank you guys. Thank you. Any other public comments? You may raise your hand or star nine. Susan, we don't seem to have any more public comments. All right. Well, thank you, Carol. And thank you to everyone who joined today as members of the public and as committee members and participants. We appreciate your continued engagement. I look forward, I'll give a shout out if Sharon's still here. I'm heading to the Inland Empire this week to um, celebrate the great work happening there on their local master plan for aging planning. Looking forward to that. So thank you all for for being with us today and we'll be in touch till we meet again. Bye-bye.